Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Actually, we are going to continue uh, where we left on the supply chain risk. Uh, the last time, uh, uh, what we did was uh, we had taken the definition of a supply chain risk and also dealt with extensively all the risks that can arise in the supply chain, resource related risks institution risk and risks in the delivery service mechanism. So I have given lots of examples uh, to give the risk. Why is it important to to list all the risks that, that happen or that influence the supply chain? So this is because unless uh, you diagnose the fault, you cannot rectify it. So it is very important that you know uh, what, are, what are all the risks that then you can try to mitigate the risks. So, what we are going to do today is about the risk mitigation strategies. So, the community risk is one of the biggest risks, particularly in emerging markets like in India. And I'll take one example, like uh, what is called the Tata Singur case, where the Tatas uh, had an automobile plant, which is for the Nano, which is a one lakh car, which is a very popular uh, car, and that has been in uh, uh, in West Bengal in place called Singur and they have to move out and that was because of the community risk. So uh, such things like that happen several times in several cases where we have seen last time the infrastructure like roads, the ports, buildings and so on. They take a lot of time that is because of land acquisition and other problems. So land belongs to somebody who is either farmer or somebody and then he does not want to sell it because if he waits the the prices, the real estate prices will go up. So for whatever reason people do not want to sell and you are against, going against his free uh, freedom of speech, freedom of action and so on. So what we need to look at or how do you risk, uh, mitigate that risk kind of thing. It is a very, very special case that is why. I have separated this from the rest of the lecture. That is because community risk <coughs> they lead to what is called wicked problem, which are very difficult to solve. It has to be solved only through negotiations and so on. And the second thing is risk propagates and amplifies. So we have to take an engineering approach when you are trying to create a resilient supply chain. What is resili a resilient supply chain? You have, your system should be able to function in spite of the faults that occur inside the system, inside, inside, in spite of the failures. If you take a computer, if you have a dual processor, then if one processor fails, the other works. This is called uh, triple modular redundancy and other kinds of things. And if one sensor fails, in a, 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 a thermocouple sensor fails uh, in a boiler, then uh, still, because there is an alternate way of measurement of the temperature, still it, it functions. So, in engineering systems, people are used to there is nothing, no engineering system is failure free. So, there is a maintenance, there is a maintenance repair and, and operations always trying to do once a failure happens. So, we should borrow some of these concepts of engineering maintenance and repair into supply chain and see what we can do here. That is what how we create uh, resilient supply chains and finally we conclude this particular chapter. So let us look at what is the Tata Hingur case. Tata, Tata Motors is the lastest, largest passenger and commercial vehicle manufacturer of India, <coughs> a part of Tata group of companies and it holds 96 operating companies in seven business sectors. These datas are there. It is a very famous company in India. In 2003, Ratan Tata Chairman Tata Group embarked on a vision to build a nano, what is called a people's car, 
Why? He says, I observed families riding on two wheelers, which is very common in India. The father driving the scooter, his young kid standing in front of him, his wife seated behind him holding the little baby. It led me to wonder whether one could conceive of a safe, affordable, all-weather form of transportation for such a family. Well, when you are using a scooter or it's a two-wheeler, then if it rains, then you cannot travel. So, but on the other hand, he wanted to create for almost the same price, which is safe, affordable, and all-weather form of transportation for such a family, which cannot afford the usual cars that we have. So, this is where his vision was to have what is called a 1 lakh car. 1 lakh is 100,000 rupees, which is equivalent today to less than $2,000. So, several governments, when Tata's had booted this idea, then several state governments, they wanted Tata's to establish the plants and they were offering a lot of subs. The state of West Bengal in Calcutta, it offered 997 acres of land, 647 was for the nano plant, 290 acres for ancillary units, and 60 acres for industrial development corporation. So the total is approximately 1000 acres. And the farmers started agitations with the support of the opposition party. Because these are, this is a fertile land where the farmers were using produce, and it is the produce that they, that they are using. Uh, for their support and livelihood. So the farmers started as station and the opposition parties, they started, uh, they helped the farmers to agitate more. And the state government supported by the high court ruling, so it all went to the high court. And uh, the high court ruled that in January 2008, that uh, the land has been legally acquired for public interest. Uh, through Land Acquisition Act and urged all farmers to accept the compensation package offered by the state. Now here what happens in India is that the state owns the land and it acquires from the farmers and it delivers, gives it to the industry. Now farmers are saying the industrialists are making so much of profit, so why not they pay more? So there is a compensation package and an issue that is involved. And Tata started building the plant along with the partners. So, the issue here is there is a vision to have a low cost car for affordable by um, lower middle class families and the state government wanted to have that plant so it can create jobs, it will create, it will boost the, the employment uh, potential and the economics of the state. So, they are given approximately 1000 campus land from taking it away from the farmers and since it is all legal and the high court also is ruled in favor of uh, the Tata's and this particular uh, project, then Tata started building the plant. So the supply chain was meticulously planned. You know, because it's a one lakh car, it's a low cost car. So whenever there is a low cost, you have to minimize the cost at every place. So, that's where uh, it meticulously planned co-locating all the vendors so that the transport costs are minimal, auxiliary units and proximity of the plant and what is called the Gopur Highway in Kolkata in West Bengal. And it is closer to the port, so the transportation is also, is also cheaper. The land acquisition procedure and short term address were not seriously taken by the Tatas. Well, so, and they, they relied on the government of West Bengal, which also took the judiciary into uh, this one to look into the land acquisition procedures and they started building the plants. So they started construction of the plant and installation of the machines to commence operations at the earliest. Their partners also built. So basically there, there is something like uh, where rupees 15,000 crores have been spent in making this present planet. So I'm going through this with uh, through the whole procedure. That's because what is what is what went wrong, and finally all of us know that Tata's have to leave this, and the project came to a high grinding halt, and Tata's have moved to another state before Nano was rolled out. So 
when everything was taken, when Tata's think that they have followed all the procedures meticulously, followed the book, what went wrong? The nano was supposed to be launched in a month. Then Tata's leave Singapore because the agitations of the farmers did not stop. The spate of agitations intensified to such an extent that the inventory in the nano plant was damaged, factory gates were not allowed to be opened and employees of the nano plant were assaulted. So there were people sitting, opposition party members and farmers sitting on hunger strike. And they were sitting in front of the gate, they are not allowing everybody. If anybody wants to enter the plant, then they were assaulting them. So because of this kind of situation, several other state governments offer sites. So you should see the opportunity, other governments, state governments wanted to take this opportunity. Worried about the prolonged agitation signals the project and the security of its employees, Tata's finally pulled out of Singapore to the state of Gujarat. Now Gujarat state offered them uh, enough incentives and so they basically went out of this one. So what what is the, what does the story tell us? The story is that when you wanted to land, there are two kinds, when you are in the supply chain case, there are two things. One is the project planning. What is project planning? You have to acquire land, build your facilities, and bring your machinery, and put everything in place. That's the first project planning. The second thing is, once you have installed all the machineries, then you should start your production and start the supply chain planning. Now, there are two aspects, two different aspects to this. Now, the people that pe the, the, the industries make is they will have the same CEO for both the operations. In other words, for a project planning, which involves land acquisition, building construction, acquisition of machinery, and so on, and dealing with the locals, any problems, and so on, these are all the project planning problems. Whereas once the machinery is set, the supply chain planning is all professional. So a CEO for supply chain planning, can he handle the locals? Can he speak the local language? Can he talk to the government? Can he talk to the judiciary? Can he talk to the opposition parties? Can he negotiate with the opposition members and so on? and try to arrive at a decision? The answer is a big no. The capabilities that are needed for running a, a smooth supply chain factory and the domain knowledge that is required there is much different from running a, a project which is particularly highly sensitive to the locals and he should know the local language, he should know the local politicians, he should know the local people, and so on. So basically, I try and speak the local language to convince people. But that's where the whole thing went wrong. None of them benefited. Tata certainly did not benefit because they had to relocate the entire plant, which cost them a lot of money. And it has also delayed. They wanted to they, uh, launch the, uh, the nano in a month, but it has got delayed. And the government of West Bengal also did not benefit as it could neither convince the opposition party nor the Tatas to wait until the talks materialize. And it suffered a lot of ill will because a lot of companies which basically wanted to establish along with the, the once the nano is successful, it, uh, the New York Times headline says the world is waiting for nano to come out. Then once this has happened and Tata's have a lot of rep reputation and they have industries all over in all over India and they, so if they cannot do it, who can do it? So that's the kind of logic uh, that has given a lot of ill will to the state of West Bengal. And the farmers obviously did not benefit because those who protested to get their land back did not get till date and their land abandoned after Tata's pulled away. So basically once Tata's uh, pulled away, the land becomes worthless. That's because nobody wants that land and the whatever has been transferred to Tata's, it has not been transferred back to the farmers. So the project did not serve the purpose intended to 
So, what is this kind of questions that arise? Did this magnanimous project of global importance end up in a fiasco because of the negligence and underestimation of minute factors? Is that this one? The second factor is several MNCs who wanted to open shops in West Bengal have either postponed or abandoned their plans. Lack of talent and negotiation skills is responsible for this debate. Is that the problem? So, such problems in society where uh, several partners, government on one side, the industry on another side, the people on the third side, opposition parties on the fourth side, and on the fifth side, other states who are trying to lure Tata's into this. So, there are five or six partners who are basically trying to get the problem solved in their own way. So, such problems are called wicked problems. It's a phrase used in social planning to describe problems of this type which are difficult or impossible to solve. They are difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to realize, recognize. In other words, here there are five or six players, there are dominant players and everyone is right. The farmers are saying, look, this is my uh, land which my grandfather has given and if you take it away, I do not have any food. If you are giving me, uh, then you give me a proper compensation before you take it. Then the government is saying, look, if it ought to come here, you know, the others also will come. The, the economy of the state will improve, will provide jobs and so on. It is good for, for the state of West Bengal. Well, the Tatas are saying, look, if you, there are several offers, but we came here because of the port of Calcutta and also since you are offering the land at a, at a convenient price for us and we came along with all our people. So, and it is a one lakh car, so we cannot afford to pay much more. Well, the opposition party is saying, look, you know, you have bundled this and we are a party, we are on the part, on the side of the or the poor farmers who want to support them. And other states are saying, look, uh, you know, we will we'll give you a lot of subs, why don't you come here? So, everybody is right in this world. So, how do you solve such problems? Because of complex interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. So, if the, uh, the, the So, these are called wicked problems. How do you solve wicked problems? Let us look at social complexity. Social complexity is a function of the number and diversity of players involved in a project with strong and accurate opinions of them. So, I mentioned in the Tata Singer case, there are five or six partners each having their own opinions and each is right. And the conflicting views among various stakeholders lead to no acceptable solution causing projects not to take off. So, here there are conflict farmers want more money, Tata's cannot give, they want it immediately. The state of West Bengal want to give the compensation uh, as agreed and the opposition party wants to bring down the ruling party. There are the various, everybody is right in their own way, they are playing their cards. So, but is it possible to negotiate in such a case? The problems in which social complexity is coupled with fragmentation of decision making is called wicked problems. Let us look at characteristics of wicked problems. The problem involves many stakeholders with different values and priorities. The problem is difficult to come to grips with and changes with every attempt to address it. Now, I do not know whether the West, state of West Bengal or the Tatas recognize that they were, it was a wicked problem and it was a failure of negotiation skills. Because it is very difficult to say, they think that you know this is this is a straight forward problem, somebody did not agree, so we moved out and so on. But on the other hand, there, there is a community loss here. In other words, for the years Tata's have spent 
and Tata's have lost money, everybody has lost money without any gains here. So this is a loss of the country. So this kind of thing should not be happen and so on. And each time you change at one point it is between between Tata's and farmers. Another time it is between opposition and the state and the state government. At another time it is in the court between the opposition, the state government and Tata's and so on. And another point it is West Bengal versus other states. So the problem sh starts shifting. So there is no right answer to the problem. Yeah, everybody is right. So every implementable solution to the problem has consequences. Yes. It is also easy to see in this. There is no definitive formulation of the problem. In other words, you cannot solve this as an optimization problem. They are called hard war problems. And every problem is essentially unique and the problem has no precedence. In other words, if it happens, of course, one, if you say land acquisition act, land acquisition act, uh, the land is different in Andhra Pradesh to uh, it is different in Tamil Nadu, it is different in some other state. So, but still, the land may be land, but the, the problem becomes unique at every place. At one point, it could be for a port, at another place, it could be for uh, some other industry, at some other point, it is for a plane, uh, to, for a power plant, and so on. So, one has to treat each of them as a unique this one. So, how do you solve those problems? So, traditional way of solving such problems, decision making problems is what is called operations research. You use lot of optimization, modeling, simulation and so on. But what we hear are soft or this is the term that the people use that is soft operations research employs predominantly qualitative, rational, interpretative and structured techniques to interpret, define and explore various perspectives of the wicked problems under scrutiny. So basically there should be somebody who looks at the entire problem and is it then the most important thing that one has to look at here is, is it important to solve this problem and find a solution? Should Tata's really get this land? Well, if it is in the interest of the society, interest of the government, it is the interest of the economy and if one decides that since they have already started this, it is good for the country, good for the people and so on, then one should try and negotiate for this. What are the negotiations? It is called dialogue mapping. Dialogue mapping is a process that allows diverse groups to generate coherence around wicked problems. There are several ways of solving uh, these wicked problems. For example, a government can bring a law saying that it is allotted and any actions that other by anybody does is illegal and they are liable for prosecution. That is an authoritative way of solving it. So, well, that that is also done in several countries and several places and it is possible to do that. But there is another way of doing is called a collaborative networking. In other words, you talk to people and have a dialogue and convince them it is a project that has to be approved and you find out who gets what and negotiate and each fellow goes beyond. In this particular case, the farmers instead of getting X amount for, uh, for their land per acre, they get 0.9 X amount. So the farmers go back and they, they say, instead of Tata say, they instead of paying something, Tata may say that they will give jobs to some of the uh, people in the in farmers' sons, daughters who are, who are employable in this. And state government say it may give some, some money to Tata's to compensate for all this. So each one retaliates, go back, goes back and then renegotiation starts. This is a collaborative way of decision making. Then problem is solvable. The method in a meeting facilitator paraphrases captures all the views in a hypertext diagram on the screen. This is called a dialogue map. And the result a dialogue map does not provide any solution. 
It facilitates common understanding of the problem by all stake stakeholders and helps them arrive at a consensus. So when somebody sees this is good thing to, to be done and it has to be done and let's negotiate what everybody gets it and it's in the interest of the people of this country and so on. And the effect is the decision will have to be taken by all the stakeholders involved in the process and they will develop a sense of ownership and responsibility for the solution and all of them will respect and adhere to it. So whatever solution is obtained from dialogue mapping, uh, this is a tool that to tame the wicked problems. It is basically you know you are solving in a collaborative networking fashion uh, these problems. I mean there are several problems of this kind and I do not know whether uh, Tata's followed this dialogue mapping have a meeting every time it ended up with the with the in a chaotic fashion. So there are a lot of wicked problems that are there. One are environmental degradation. There is this terrorism, I mean particularly jihad, the terrorism, they think they are saving the world, they are saving their religion, they are saving their people. And poverty, global warming, long term social planning, organization planning, there are several wicked problems which are solvable in this and so on. So they suffice it to say that uh, there are lots of problems particularly the institutions face uh, that uh, the community risk particularly coming out of land, water, for example installing nuclear power plants in a place. I mean the government say we want a nuclear power plant because we want a green power that to the this one the coal power is not good we do not have enough coal and so on and the people say if there is a blast then we will get affected. Uh, so there are several several issues that, that come in here and either the government has to come in in an authoritative way or it has to convince people that uh, they will take all the precautions so that the nuclear disaster will not happen even if it happens they will mitigate that risk and they in an understandable way to all the people they should put all this on a piece of paper and circulate it or explain it to people. So that is what happens uh, in, the, in the community problems. Another important problem that is facing the governments today is the cyber security. As we have seen earlier that supply chains are highly connected. They are connected through the, all the goods, information and financial flows are connected and the internet plays a very big role in connecting the information and the finances and so on. But as we also saw the connectedness also brings risk and one of the risks that have been discovered in the last two years is what is called cyber security. So what are cyber risks? Disruptions to supply chain flows caused by IT defects or damage. Now what happens if your power network fails? Well everything comes to a grinding halt. You may have a battery backup but the backup only works for some time. But what happens if your IT system goes? You do not have any backups. I mean you can have backups, uh, your battery for your compu own computers and so on. What about your network? So it becomes unoperational. So the flows, this disruption to the flows, supply chain flows by IT, it is called cyber risk. And this cyber risk, if it happens due to a natural calamity, that is a different thing. But it is happening as cyber attacks. In other words, somebody is doing this intentionally. This is like a war. So exposure to malicious actors through remote the remote exploitation of IT weaknesses. In other words, somebody gets into your computer, he steals all the files, all your passwords and so on. Exposure to malicious actors through installation of corrupted or counterfeit ITs. In other words, the, the software that is there in the computer is counterfeit or corrupted. So it is corrupted with a virus and the virus will send out all your password, all your information, whatever you type it is transmitted to somebody else. So they know your username and password to your bank account and they can basically steal your money. So the cyber attack with all the 
innovations that we discussed earlier. The cyber attack is a big this one. Now, cyber attack by people is different. But what is happening? Cyber attack by people, the ter terrorists and thieves is a different issue. But now, the recent cyber attacks are by the governments. And that is the problem that creates another thing. The hacktivist groups targeted businesses in recent cyber attacks by hacking and defacing websites of businesses and government entities for purposes of political and policy protest. Well, this is one thing, you know, they enter into your uh, your website and change all your your biodata and other things, your policies, so that you get a bad name. And Hackwist also conducted what is called distributed denial of service attacks. That is, they basically a network resource like a bank or a credit card payment gateways are connected to the internet or unavailable, uh, are unavailable to the users. So, they make a particular server inactive, but that is more problem is here is there is a, a software called is a computer worm called Stuxnet. In June 2010, it was discovered attack of nuclear facilities of Iran. The Iran nuclear power plant was disabled. It did not function in June 2010. Why? It is because of the Stuxnet computer worm. What is this worm? You know, Stuxnet spreads indiscriminately via Microsoft Windows and Spice and Subverts, Siemens supervisory control and data acquisition system. Now, the supervisory control and data acquisition system or SCADA is a very important thing in industries. Any industry was got a, what are called PLCs, programmable logic controllers, and all these PLCs are connected to a main computer, and they are all used for data acquisition as well as control. In other words, if you have a factory floor, you have all numerical machines, control machines. Each numerical control machine is controlled by a PLC. All the PLCs are controlled by two egg, uh, another another PLC, which basically controls whatever flows through the machine shop. And now what happens is if that PLC is affected, in other words, the Stuxnet infects the PLCs by subverting step 7 software applications that are used to reprogram these devices. So, if the control system is affected, is, is becomes defective, then there will be a particular problem unless you have a redundant control system. So, but usually you do not have a redundant control system. Control system is the one that is supposed to take care of all the uh, factors both you, during faulty times and during normal times. But here these people are affecting and these are Siemens uh, products and Siemens supervisory control and data acquisition systems were affected. This was recent cyber attacks that made history. Now, what happens here? I mean, the Stuxnet is supposed to have been done by some governments uh, to affect the Iranian nuclear power plants. So, this is becoming like cyber warfare between countries by, by disabling your aircraft, by disabling uh, your nuclear, uh, nuclear power plants, by dis disabling your power plant operations and so on. Because these are all standardized control equipment which are accessible and if they are basically since they are accessible, if they are pirated and you are basically uh, worms are basically attack those facilities, then you have a problem. So, the, the world is entering into, into this into a phase where these, these, the risk attacks are increasing by the communities, by the governments attacking the finances, attacking the, uh, the information infrastructure and the power infrastructure and all that is becoming a, a big issue nowadays. So, what we have did uh, so far is to, is to consider 
the, all there is. Now let us look at uh, how this propagate uh, this one. In a globalized world, the risk for the supply chain could come from three from three <coughs> other very important factors which are often ignored. Connectness on a global scale, large scale concentration for competitive efficiency, and lack of governance for fast response. Let us look at a particular diagram. Supposing <coughs> there is a supplier from you you are sourcing and he is there is a disruption in the supplier. In other words, there is a fire in his factory or done so on. Now, what do you do? You are sourcing from that supplier and the supplier for some reason becomes in effect. So, you sometimes you keep inventory okay, or sometimes you do not keep inventory. If you are a lean, uh, JIT and so on, then you may not keep inventory. So, if you do not have inventory, you try to procure from the market. In other words, you go onto the web, you go to the uh, an open exchange and try to buy it or buy it from some other place. Well, most probably you may get it if it is not a very critical component which is specially made for you. If it is a generalized component like uh, a processor uh, or a power supply kind of thing, you can always be able to access it, but sometimes you may not be able to get it. So, what we are trying to do here is what a decision flow diagram, how once a flow or once a, a disruption occurs. If you map like this, then you know how to mitigate those kind of risks. So, how the risk flows in the inside the, your system. So, we have said if you have inventory, then you do not have any problem, you solved the problem. Point eight with probability point eight, you have an inventory. You have a problem if you don't have an inventory, and you can procure from the market. Then you procure it. Then you are done. But supposing you don't have the inventory and you cannot procure from the market, then customer unwilling to accept late delivery. You go and call the customer saying that look, you know, uh, uh, I have a supplier failure. So, because my production has stopped, because I have tried not trying to, I'm trying to access from the market, I couldn't get it. So, can I deliver after one month? Well, the customer is willing to accept the delivery, then you are done. Then you can procure, you have time, you are basically buying time when customer is willing to accept. A customer unwilling to accept the delivery, he will try to procure from some other place and so on. If the customer is willing to take the delivery, ideal manufacturing cap not sold, suppliers not postponed. There are two, this one. What happens is if supplier is willing to accept late delivery, then you are okay as far as this particular supply is concerned, but your manufacturing capacity, you have scheduled the production of this particular product on your manufacturer line, thinking that everything goes okay. Your supply chain planning ERP systems will tell you you have this particular product is to be made during this particular time 14th, 15th of this month. What do you do with that capacity? So, you try to idle manufacturing capacity you can sort, but then you never usually have one supplier. If one supplier there, there are several components, but like for example, in auto plants, there are 3000 other uh, suppliers who are supplying and basically for one, this one, the other suppliers either, they, if you ask them, you also postpone because they, this component I am not getting and sometimes they agree, sometimes they do not agree. So, you have several cases that is coming here, ideal manufacturing capacity sold supply is postponed. That is an ideal situation. Idle manufacturing capacity is sold, supply is not postponed. That is because you basically, that is a very big chance. So, you have basically not postponed. So, you have to maintain the inventory of these supplies. Idle manufacturing cap not sold and supplies postponed. This basically is another case. So, your, your capacity gets wasted away and your supplies, you have to maintain the supplies and so on. 
And here, if the customer is willing to accept late delivery, then idle manufacturing capacity is sold. Idle manufacturing capacity supplier not supply not cancelled. Idle manufacturing cap sold. Supplies cancelled. Idle manufacturing capacity not sold. Supplies not cancelled. So you have four cases here: idle manufacturing capacity sold, and supplies cancelled. Idle manufacturing capacity sold, supplies not cancelled, and so on. So basically, what happens here is when customer is willing to accept late delivery, then you get into all these problems because you have an idle capacity. So what I'm going to try to so is basically, your if you want to make a decision, how do you create a res resiliency here? One thing is. You want to have inventory. Instead of going through all this idle capacity and all these problems, you can basically have a cost estimates of all these options. And you say, look, the better I have the inventory, I need not have to stop. If I have a 15 days or one month inventory, then uh, you know other things will take care of it. So that's one way of doing it. But on the other hand, if you want to have a lean mean system and if I don't want to have inventory, then you, you want to procure for the market in case you have an alternate source which is there, then that's also fine. But if both don't work out, then you get into some kind of problems. So this basically, uh, uh, of course, you will, you will have uh, since your inventory then when you have inventory, your idle manufacturing capacity can and the suppliers, other suppliers cancellations, these issues won't arise in this particular case, in these two cases. In those two cases, you are using the existing capacity as well as other suppliers, but you get into this kind of problems only in the other two cases. So what does this diagram tell us? This diagram tells you the various factors that happens and once you know the probabilities that and also the cost estimates, then you can decide whether you want to have inventory or you want to take a chance. Another uh, popular uh, uh, thing that happens in terms of uh, 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 the uh, supply chain risk is what is called the port shutdown or the manufacturer's response. Now, this happens very frequently. For example, the Los Angeles port, uh, the laborers were on strike and the port was shut down. Okay, so once the port is shut down, then in other words, the, all the uh, ships that are going there, they cannot be unloaded and uh, they have to be diverted to some other place or the, the shipments, they did not, should not take shipment. Whatever goes through Panama Canal has to go through via Suez, Suez Canal. Supposing there is a strike on Panama Canal, then you will have a lot of problems. So, if there is a port closure, can continue to supply the customer. Then, uh, uh, this uh, additional trans can continue procurement, cannot continue procurement from the supply. There, uh, these are the options here, and inventory. Yeah, for example, customer uh, inventory available, inventory not available, local alternative suppliers available, local alternative suppliers unavailable, customer unwilling to wait, customer willing to wait. So there is a basically several, uh, this one that happens, cannot continue to supply to the customer, alternate routes unavailable. In other words, you can, when the port closure, you can still continue, but there is an additional transport cost. In other words, if if it is, uh, say, there is a, a shipping strike, you can go to another another port and continue the procurement from the suppliers, and they you can the inventory available, inventory not available. For each of these cases, you can still continue to supply. But supposing you cannot continue supply, then alternate routes are unavailable. Alternate routes are available. Additional cost of transportation and so on, the cost of shutdown. So basically what I am saying here is that your manufacturing response depends on 
whether you can continue to supply to suppliers or you cannot continue to supply depending on the additional the this one here and there is the cost of shutdown cost of large sales cost of shifting production cost of additional transportation in all these particular in all these cases so what i'm saying here really if you map these diagrams then uh, it becomes easy for you to see where your fault points are now how do you create a resilient supply chain based on all the knowledge that we gained here there are many actors risk management need to be radically modified with changing role of governments in the economy and dismantling of state owned manipulation monopolies public issues related to risk nowadays involve a variety of actors including corporations representatives of civil society non government organizations and so on so all we are saying here is that uh, you know we are having uh, the uh, the issue of ecosystem this one but what is resilience resilience is the ability to resume and restore operations after disruption this is like what i am saying that in engineering systems we are used to resilience in other words a system operates you go and repair it operates or you have a dual modular redundancy or triple modular redundancy in spite of the failure then the system still operates so is it possible to have resilience of this uh, in the supply chains resilience can be achieved either through redundancy or through building flexibility into the supply chain we have seen in the in the case of example of a supplier failure if you have redundancy that is basically if you have uh, uh, inventory or a dual supplier then you could do it but you can also build flexibility into the supply chain standard use of redundancy includes either excess capacity or use of safety stock of material and finished goods or dual sourcing or manufacturing in multiple sites so this is what we have seen in the in in that example you have melt safety stock and also a dual sourcing you have another place where you can source it from an inventory can give a company time to plan its recovery following a disruption indeed many companies have increased inventory spend preparing for a disruption so inventory can give a company time to plan we have seen this in that uh, uh, supplier disruption example and in terms of flexibility to build flexibility and resilience for resilience companies must have all many facets of supply chain design so developing ability to move production among plants that's flexibility in other words you have two plants one in singapore another in eastern europe if there is a problem in eastern europe move to singapore if there is a if in normal times you do it in eastern europe use interchangeable and generic parts of many products and cross train employees in other words you can basically interchangeable parts it's not not have to be standardized parts but same power it can be used the power supply can be used and the things are are generic designing products and processes for maximum postponement as many operations and decisions are possible in the supply chain see this postponement is one of the things you postpone till the order finally comes so you design products so that you can postpone maximum of your things till the final order comes farms rely on global shipments should build decision support that can advise shifting delivery routes to different checkpoints if need based on the information at border crossing so before you ship you find out what is the situation at the border crossing and you find out instead of shifting to one location you can shift it to another another uh, ship it to another another port and then uh, truck it from there shifting one mode of transportation such as air freight to backup routes by another mode so in turn these steps may raise costs and affect production lead times and inventory levels well suffice it to say that both flexibility as well as uh, the redundancy they cost money there are the ways in which you can create a resilient supply chain now but the the point is any resilience or any reliability into your supply chain it is going to be cost 
uh, costing money. So, you want to operate, you want your system to operate even in spite of some of the failures. So, if you want to do that, you have to spend more money and so on. So, the common global risk strategies are the following. Six broad non-exclusive strategies for a government, corporation or individual is, are the following. The first option is seek to avoid the risk wherever possible. You know, so we do not go to the place where there is risk. Second option is to mitigate the risk directly. Attempt to reduce the impact of likelihood of the risk, jewel sourcing, keeping inventory or examples. Third option is uncertainty reduction through collaborative effects of sharing data, risk related information and in preparing supply chain, long term contracts and so on. And fourth option is to adopt risk by preparing for its occurrence. Well, this is like uh, mandate that buildings should be flood prone, either elevate the structures and so on. So, you know that you are preparing for the risk occurrence. The fifth option is transfer of risk by insuring to a third party. And the final and critical option involves accepting the residual risk. In other words, you know risk is possible and the organization or individual is well aware of the potential impact and can hold resource or make other provisions to deal with the possible consequences. Well, either you ignore the risk, say whatever happens, happens or you take it for, for this one. So, I am prepared, I will spend this extra money to keep inventories to do whatever with this one. So, there is, there is no uh, uh, other ways of, of doing it. You have to either have redundancy or flexibility or the ways to uh, get at this one. So, what are the conclusions? You have to basically balance here your risk versus your resilience. So, design of resilient supply chains is an important topic and should focus on specific vertical. So, the the conclusions that one gets are different for different verticals. For oil and gas, it is different from electronics, it is different to for auto and so on. No supply chain strategy will eliminate risk, nor should it because as the cost would be too high. This is like saying that uh, no humans no, should not get a disease. Well, you cannot make a human not get a disease. The managers can excel in identifying, quantifying and preparing for the new realities of risk. So, this is one of the things because there is unexpected risk and there is the expected risk. This is unexpected risk is the, is the becomes, becomes a problem. This is like somebody who has, who is normal getting a heart attack, then the, that is unexpected risk. But somebody who has a blood pressure and diabetes getting a heart attack an expected risk. Determining whether greater resilience is worth extra cost is a part of the new management function. So, the management need to decide whether they need the extra this one or they do not want the extra this aid. So, basically this is between the, the, the cost you spend to create resilience and this is what you suffer, the losses you make when the failure occurs. So, which one is the balancing act is the one that is a part of the management function. So, the, suffice it to say that the supply chains are getting uh, leaner and once they are getting leaner, what is happening <coughs> in the supply chain literature is the, the global supply chains are basically more risk prone and there are several partners who are creating the risk from government social groups to the ports to the, the companies and the terrorists everybody. So, and the risk is becoming more soft oriented. In other words, it is that a community risk or cyber risk and so on which are difficult to, to first uh, in, uh, 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 to find out that there is a risk and also later to mitigate this. So, the supply chain risk is, is a very important topic that is attracting the attention of people nowadays. Thank you.